Praise the Lord. This morning we pray and trust that you have enjoyed the uh, Christmas program to this point and our service here at, at Paint Creek Baptist Church and those who have participated from near and far. Uh, the wonders of, of modern technology that allow you to still participate and not be in the building. So every parent and child and, and various ones, singers, musicians that have participated, we certainly thank God uh, for you. And we know that the Lord is blessing uh, this program and blessing this service. I just want to speak to you today, uh, just a simple Christmas message uh, that I want to uh, bring attention to um, the passage found in Luke. Uh, again, Luke, the first chapter, verses 39 um, and preceding. If I were to give a, a, a title to this message uh, this morning, it would be, How Great Is Our God? How great is our God? And we're going to uh, take a break from finding the major and the minor uh, just for one Sunday. And since this is the Sunday that is preceding Christmas, uh, I want to just deal with where the minor prophets have ultimately been pointing. And that is to the birth and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you would not mind uh, to bow with me in just for a few moments and then we will read our text and and go into our message for today. God, we thank you and we love you and, and uh, we give you glory uh, in this place today. I thank you for my space in the building. I thank you for all those who uh, will watch this service, this message. I pray that you be glorified in all things and you get the glory for you are truly worthy of all the glory. There is none like you and Lord, we praise you today for we are are fearfully and wonderfully made and we praise you today because you have sent the greatest gift of your son uh, Jesus Christ and we praise you today because you have done so much for us we praise you today because you're a great God we praise you for who you are Lord bless this message now bless this vessel that you have poured into and I pray that I will represent you correctly Lord in front of those who may not know you and to encourage those who do know you but are having a hard time and to strengthen those who are on this walk this journey in jesus name we pray we thank you lord again thank you jesus and amen if you have your bibles then you will see that in uh, the book of luke uh, dr luke if you will um, he was a physician and we are going to look at the gospel of Jesus Christ according to Luke. Amen. And uh, it is recorded in chapter 1, verse 39. And this picks up where we left off after our devotional reading. It says, And Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste, into a city of Judah, and entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For lo, as soon as the voice of your salutation, thy salutation sounded in mine ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she that believeth, for there shall be a performance of those things which were told from the Lord. And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. For he has regarded the low estate of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. He hath showed strength with his arm. He hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. 
He hath filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he hath sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. And he has spake to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. And Mary abode with her about three months and returned to her own house. We know God's word is already blessed. And Luke records this passage uh, for us. He records this passage for us and writes down uh, what happened. Um, so he shows uh, Jesus uh, as Luke presents the son of man. Uh, Jesus came to save all sorts of people. He came to save Jews. He came to save Gentiles. He came to save men and women and children and outcasts and he came to save those high up in society. He came to save the lowdowns. He came to save shepherds and wise men and kings and the least and the most and the unlikelies. He, he came to save all. This is a powerful and a beautiful and an interesting passage of scripture that happens prior to what we generally focus in on at, at the manger, but it is nonetheless very important in fact, had it not happened, the manger would not have happened. And you must understand that what happens in this passage is shortly after Gabriel's message to Mary. And there are applications that I want to share with you today uh, from what Elizabeth says, from what Mary says in, uh, definitely. Um, greatness is defined in many different ways today by many different people. When we talk about the fact of how great our God is, we must understand his greatness is not measured by money or by success or by power or, or by how long of duration that, that he lasts. It's not made, his, his greatness is not measured by position or, or many of the other things that we measure greatness. You know, of recent, there's been a big debate as to who the, the greatest wide receiver is. Another receiver made comments about he felt he was the greatest, and this one wasn't. He was on down the line. People measure greatness in different ways. Yet, when we speak of the greatness of God, it is enough to say that God is great. He's great all by himself, and he is greatly to be praised. He does not need money to be great. He does not need a position to be great. He does not need to be acclaimed to be great. He does not need prestige to be great. But he is great because of who he is. He is great because of who he is. And there are four things in this passage that point to the greatness of God. Things that Mary says, things that the scripture are recorded that are spoken, and it shows the greatness of God in this situation, in this first Advent season, in the coming of Christ, we see the greatness of God. The first thing that I want to share with you that shows that God is great, and it may not seem like much, but it should grab your attention. It should make you sit up and take notice of how great God is is. Notice in verse 28 of the first chapter, it says that the angel came and said to Mary, and his first words are as he was there maybe fluttering over Mary, and she hadn't noticed him, but as he goes down and speaks to her, he says, Hail, thou art highly favored. Amen. Hail, thou art highly favored. And if you look in verse 30, he says it again, uh, Thou hast found favor with God. Amen. So the first thing that, that shows me the greatness of God is the simple fact that God favors the unfavorable. Amen. God favors the unfavorable. The angel informs Mary that she will carry the Christ child. And God favors Mary because she is humble and she is willing to be a servant. He says, Hail, thou art highly favored. Now, the Bible does say that she was puzzled, but she was not resistant. She didn't get upset at the angel because 
She had life plans and goals and things that she wanted to do, and she figured that this will interrupt my uh, life plans. It, 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 that's not as it's recorded. It says that she pondered at these things. She was puzzled at the manner of the angel's salutation, yet she was willing. Amen. What, what is the reasoning behind this? Well, if you remember what Genesis 3.15, it says God was always planning. God had always planned that he would bring salvation into the world through his son, Jesus Christ, through the seed of the woman. Amen. Notice this, through the seed of the woman, this was a unique plan of God. And this seed would crush the enemy's hand and, and crush the enemy's head and crush his plan over fallen man. You see, what makes God great today, church, is very simply that God's wisdom is not the same as man's wisdom. God does not process and, and think as man thinks. In fact, you could say it this way. God does what many think we uh, uh, should not be done. And he accomplishes things with those and with things that many would not even use. Scripture bears it out, church. Scripture bears out that, that if, you, if you remember the word of the Lord, if you remember Old Testament scriptures, God took an old nomad, amen. His name was Abraham and, and a barren wife and, and he birthed a nation through them. He, he used a son of slaves, Amen. The, the, the son of Jacobed, Moses, amen, to, to liberate millions of people. He took a small shepherd boy, amen, and, and, and used that boy to defeat a giant and to bring the Philistines down and encourage a nation. He, he even took a Jewish captive by the name of Daniel and had brought the king's attention to the fact that there is a God. And then now we see here that he is taking a Jewish peasant girl, amen, the lowest of the low, uh, to bring the highest in the universe into this dirty world. God didn't use a princess, amen. He, he didn't use a queen or, or a great person. He used a handmaiden, amen. Luke 148 says, uh, for he hath regarded the low estate of his handmaid. And it almost can be said a bond slave. He, he didn't use the high ups. He didn't use the, the, the common uses. He used the obscure and out of the way. In fact, if you want to be honest, look at this. God continues favoring the unfavorable when he did not place Jesus in an economically set family. He made Jesus a carpenter's son. God didn't place Jesus in a palace. He put him in a lowly stable. God didn't send hundreds of people to witness the birth, but he sent some lowly, dirty shepherds. Amen. God even didn't use a, a out there name that it was not commonly used, but he used a random name for that day, a, a, a common name, if you will, for that day. And that name was Jesus. Notice clearly that, that there was nothing that the scripture bears out that was special or uncommon about Jesus. In fact, the prophet Isaiah said it this way, for he grew up before them like a tender plant. And like a root out of dry ground. And he had no form or majesty that we should look on him. And no beauty that we should desire him. But he is despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows acquainted with grief. Praise the name of the Lord. There is nothing that was uh, 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 so special about him that would draw the greatest attention. God favors the unfavorable. Amen. Now, the application, my sisters and brothers, this morning is very simple. You, you may feel like you're out of favor with the world and with the way of things. And maybe even in your family and with your church, maybe. And even you are feeling like you're out of step with life. You're out of touch. You're, you're not in the upper echelon. And it seems like things are not going your way. You may feel like today you are the lowest of the low. And I want you to know those are the types of people that God likes to use the most. But you got to make yourself available. 
Amen. Notice that Mary, amen, Sister Mary, she says, be it unto me as according to your word. God favors the unfavorable, but he also favors the obedient. Amen. And this is what makes him great. He, he just uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. And Mary was a willing vessel. What about you? What about you? Amen. God gives grace through favor. Amen. He favors us with his grace to the point that the Apostle Paul even wrote it. And I'm going to share this verse with you because it makes a wonderful parallel. It says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself is it, it is of the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. God did it. God initiated. God favored the unfavorable. It's his doing. Amen. And even in our salvation, we don't have any part in it so that we may boast about something we've done. It is all done by God. Amen. I'm glad it's God's plan. I'm glad it's God's will. I'm glad he initiated it. Amen. So God is great this morning because he favors the unfavorable. But number two shares here that God is great because he has the power to overrule the impossible. Amen. God is great today because he has the power to overrule the impossible. When you consider the birth of Christ, Notice this, that God birthed the supernatural through the natural. Amen. It, it was not the other, other way around. He, he birthed the supernatural through the natural. So that we may understand here, there are actually in this passage of scripture, two supernatural births, technically. If you, if you read the passage, you'll see that Elizabeth is also expecting and and she is well past her time she had been barren and she is an old woman and she is well past her time for childbearing but yet she has is having a child and we know that his name will be john the baptist god is using if you look at the text god is using one that is past the time of childbearing and one that is not ready for childbearing the Bible says that Mary was a spouse, promised. That means she had not known a man. She was a virgin. Amen. She had not known a man. Yet God used this uh, uh, unfavorable peasant girl who had not known a man to bring the impossible into possibility. That's why the scripture says with God, nothing is impossible. I hope you hear me today. With God, nothing is impossible. Get this, so God being God and, and having all power, God literally knitted himself together in this young virgin's womb. Heavenly DNA being knit together in the natural, the supernatural DNA coming and being formed and, and shaped in the natural. Only God can do that. Don't, don't ask me to explain it, but just believe that God did it. I, I physically, I, I can't explain it, but all I know is what scripture says. And the Bible says in Psalms 139, we are curiously rocked or curiously knitted together in our mother's wombs so that Jesus could experience and, and touch humanity. The same happened with him, except it was supernatural. Notice what the angel said, that the power of the Lord will overshadow you and the Holy Spirit will come upon you. Amen. And that's how the birth of Christ happened. Amen. God can make something. Somebody say, yeah. God can make something out of nothing. Amen. Amen. Isn't that amazing? And, and if you think about it and compare scripture and, and, and consider this, watch this. The Bible says in Jeremiah 23, 24, that God says of himself, do I not feel, F-I-L-L, -L, do I not feel heaven and earth, amen. The heavens can't contain our God, amen, that, that he's too vast, he's too big, but yet and still he chose to reveal himself through a peasant girl. He, 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 he was able to fit 
inside of a peasant grave. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. God chose to reveal himself through a human body. Close enough for man to touch and to reach out to. Close enough for man to cry upon and to lean on. He, he, he brought his miracle of his son in this Jewish girl. She gave birth to this beautiful baby boy. Close enough, amen, to touch humanity. And close enough for us to grab a hold of him. I want you to know God is great this morning. Because he overrides the impossible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He overrides the impossible. Why? Because he is God. And, and there's nothing too hard for him. I hope you hear me today. There is nothing too hard for God. Whatever you are struggling with today, know that there's no problem too hard for God. Whatever you're going through today, whatever situation is happening in your life, there is nothing too hard for God. You may be looking at an impossibility today, but just insert God into your equation and watch what happens. Amen. When you pray regularly, expect God to take that regularly prayer, amen, that regular prayer and make something irregular happen on a regular basis, amen. I just posted that uh, the other day and noticed this, that when you expect great things from God, he's able to do that. He is a God of infinite possibilities. He overrules impossibilities. Insert God into your equation. I want you to know if I may testify for just a moment, amen, this morning. It wasn't so long ago, uh, December, back in the 70s, when a young lady was told that she could not have her baby, could not have her child naturally, amen. Something would be wrong with her or something would be wrong with the child or something would be wrong with both of them. But bless the name of the Lord up in this place that I am here 48 years later to tell you the story that God specializes have you any rivers that seem uncrossable? Have, have you any mountains that you think you can't tunnel through? God specializes and he will do what no other power can do. Praise the name of the Lord. God is great today. Tell your neighbor right where you sit. And if you don't have anybody, tell yourself. God is great because he overrules the impossible. Yeah. Number three shows me in verses 39 through 42 and verse 44, verse 46 and 47. God is great because he chooses to permeate the praises of his people. God is great because he chooses to permeate the praises of his people. I want to tell you something. God does not need our praise. He is self-sufficient. He's God all by himself. Yet, when we open up our mouths, hallelujah, hallelujah, when we open up our mouths, he comes in and he penetrates and he spreads throughout. That's what that word permeate means. And, and notice here in verse 39 and verse uh, through verses 42 and verse 44 and 46 and 47, notice in this meeting between Mary and Elizabeth, there is confirmation of the greatness of God because of the truth of the message and the messenger who brought it. Amen. The, the angel declared it, that you're going to be expecting the Christ child. Amen. I'm, the, the Lord is going to bring this miracle about. And, and here's how you will know Elizabeth is also expecting. Your cousin Elizabeth, who is old in age and is going to conceive, and she's already in her sixth month. That which said uh, that she was barren, she's expecting. So the Bible says Mary hurried to the hill country. Amen. I, I will look to the hills from whence cometh my help. Sometimes we need uh, some encouragement. Mary was troubled at the salutation, but she said, be it unto me as the word of the Lord says. But then she hurried off to the hill country, maybe to see it for herself, maybe to get some confirmation. I, I don't know, but as she came into Elizabeth's presence, there's something unique that happens. In Latin, it is called the Magnificat, which means magnifying the Lord or praising 
the Lord. Amen. Both Mary and Elizabeth here are, are experiencing something amazing. And it would have been easy when she came in to the presence of Elizabeth for the, uh, the case of the what ifs to start to happen. How many of you understand what that is? When you get a case of the what ifs, somebody says that this is going to happen or the Lord tells you this is going to happen. And then in your mind, you start to think, well, what if this turns out this way? What if this happens over here? What if this uh, goes this way? What if Mary and Elizabeth would have gotten the case of the what ifs? What if Mary would have done that? What if she said, well, what if I'm not able to have this baby? Uh, what if Elizabeth would have said that? What if I'm not able to have this baby with my age? What if people are going to talk about me? What if I'm stoned? That's what Mary said. What if I'm stoned? Because that could have happened for her coming up with a child before she was officially married. What if, what if, what if, what if Joseph doesn't believe me? What, what if he thinks I've been unfaithful uh, to him in, in our betrothal time? What if Joseph doesn't understand and decides to put me away privately? What if we are not good enough providers for this wonderful child? But you notice they did not go into a case of the what if. Somebody's got to hear me today. They did not go into the case of the what ifs. They, they did not allow any, any doubt to come in. But if you look at the recording of what ex, 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 uh, exchanges between Mary and Elizabeth, you see praise. Hallelujah. You see praise. In fact, they, they are led in a praise meeting. I wish I had a witness. They are led in a praise meeting by the baby in Elizabeth's womb. Amen. John the Baptist was not even here yet, but he was already glorifying God in Elizabeth's womb, in his mother's womb. It is recorded, I know you've seen it on Facebook and posted other places, that a fetus is the first one to ever rejoice at the presence of the Savior. Further proof that a child in the womb understands and is a person. Can you hear them as they meet? And as they greet one another and the babe leaps in their womb and they begin to laugh and say, look at us. They were overcome with the joy of the Lord. And Elizabeth rejoices as she feels that baby leap in her womb. The Bible says and she was filled with the Holy Spirit. What is the application of this? God is great because he permeates our praise. Amen. He, he saturates. He comes in. And literally dwells. The, the goodness of God should make us jump for joy. Amen. The, the praises should flow because of how he performs. Amen. And how he performs in difficult situations. I used to have an old preacher. He would say it this way. When God shows up, he, he will show out. Amen. I wish I had one witness on this recording. Notice that when God comes in, amen, he will show out. He can do great things. He, he is a great God. Hallelujah. So Mary says, listen, Elizabeth, I was a little bit nervous. I was a little bit perplexed. But then I just said, yes, Lord. Be it unto me as your word says. And this joy that I am now experiencing, I can say it too. How about you? The joy that I have, the world didn't give it and the world cannot take it away. Mary says, my soul does magnify the Lord. That, that means that she is saying, my soul makes the Lord large. My, my praises enlarge him. And not that he needs it, but that's what I choose to do. In my situation, I choose to to praise him. Mary says, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit has rejoiced in the God of my salvation. God is my savior. Why is he great? Because he sees us as his creation. He sees us weak and helpless and in a mess. And in, even when we open up our mouths, he comes in and resides in and permeates our praise. I wonder I wonder this morning, are there any pandemic praisers out there? <laughs> yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Are, are there any pandemic praisers out there? You've been shut in. You've been worried. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, 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 you've been uncertain. You've been apprehensive. You've been in doubt and you've been scared. Amen. But, but in, in the midst of it all, in the midst 
of all of this, you still have a praise on your heart. Amen. You still have a praise down on the inside. And you say, I'm going to praise my God anyhow. Why? Because he's the joy of my salvation. He is my rock. And every now and then he blesses me. How can you say that this morning that in the midst of all of the panic and all of the virus stuff, I can still praise God anyhow. Psalms 22 verse 3 says that God literally inhabits the praises of his people Israel. And if you consider that, you understand that God comes in and sets up residence. He bends his ear when he hears his people praise him. If my people which are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Part of that has to do with you opening up your mouth and speaking to the Lord, praising him. He comes in and he sets up shop. Christ grew in Mary. She was expecting this child, amen. And he grew in Mary until he couldn't grow anymore. He had to, to come out. Amen. I, I want to let you know that what's on the inside, there's the parallel today, will come out. If there's a praise on the inside, you can't help but let it out. But if there's doubt on the inside, if there's fear and grief and hate and lust and everything else, that will come out. What's in you will come out. Let there be praise. He inhabits the praises of people. He does not dwell in tabernacles made by hands, but he dwells in the hearts of the believers. So that is why I'm in here by myself right now. Amen. Me and the camera and this microphone and my Bible, but I'm not by myself because the Holy Ghost is here. Amen. My God shall supply all my needs. He's a good God. He's a great God. Somebody say amen. He's a wonderful God. Praise the name of the Lord. The word of God says he doesn't dwell in, in buildings made by hands, but he dwells in temples, amen, designed for use. You were created to praise him, created to give him glory, created to open up your mouth and tell somebody about Jesus. Amen. Christ is in us and he can do great things and accomplish great things. So Mary and Elizabeth both say, our spirits rejoice. Amen. Today, because God has come near. Amen. And I want you to know in this Christmas time, you don't have to have a gift under the tree. You don't have to have eggnog and turkeys and all that other stuff and, and Christmas trees. If you have Jesus, that is enough. He is enough to know that he came near to us. So why do we praise him? Well, here's the last part of why God is great. We, we praise him because he permeates our praise. Amen. He's great because he does that. He's great because he overrules the impossible. He's great because he has favored the unfavorable. But he's also great because look at it. Through verses 48 to, to 56, we see that God regards our helpless estate. Look at what Mary says in verse 48. She says, Mary uh, says, I realize that God, you have favored me even though I'm unfavorable. You, you, you have favored me because uh, you love me. You have favored me because it's your plan. You have favored me because I am uh, obedient. You, you are showing me favor in having me to bear this Christ child. She says, I realize you have favored me. You have regarded my low estate, my lowliness, my humble position. Amen. And so Mary says several things that obviously are meant for the Jewish people, yes. But they certainly apply to us today. And one of my favorite passages of scripture is Psalms 139, 17 through 18. And it basically says this. It says that. How great are God's thoughts towards me. David wrote this. He said, how great are God's thoughts towards me that even when I'm awake, he, he's still thinking of me. When I'm asleep, he's still thinking of me. When I, when I, I think about it and, and, and he has thought about me so much 
that his thoughts outweigh or outmeasure, outnumber the sands of the sea. His thoughts. So I'm here to tell you this morning, God is thinking about you. Even though you may be unfavorable, even though, even though it may seem like an impossibility that you and God can be together. I dare you to just open up your mouth and ask him to take charge of your situation. Take charge of your life and begin to praise him for what he's already done in this world through his son Jesus Christ. Because he's regarded our low estate. He, he has thought about us. In fact, his thoughts are more about us than we think about him. I begin to think about that, and I'll share this many times, but we were uh, fortunate enough to go on vacation years ago, and I remember laying face down in the sand on a towel, and sand, as you know, gets everywhere when you're at the beach. And I began to count the small grains of sand on the towel, and then I began to look outwardly and see all of that. I said, how many Grains of sand are on this beach and on beaches all around the world. And in that moment, God said that those numbers, that number of sand particles, sand, grains of sand is how many thoughts I've thought about you, Christian. And in that moment, I've just begun to melt there on that beach, not because it was hot, not because it, it, it was a, a, a time to, to, to just think about me. But what happened was I began to think that he thinks about me. Why would he think about me? What, what, is, what about me would, would, would draw him to me? But the, the, the truth of the matter is he's a great God. He's a good God. His thoughts are towards me. So notice how what Mary says matches up in application to where we should be at this Christmas. He's done great things. That's what she says. God has done great things. And the fact that he sent Jesus to do for you what you could not do for yourself. God has done great things. He has shown mercy to those who reverence his name. Amen. He has pulled down the proud and the mighty and raised the humble. Help me, Holy Ghost. He has fed the hungry with good things. He has helped Israel. That's what Mary says. She says he has remembered his promise to Abraham. To make of him a great nation in which one day a king, an eternal king, will sit on the throne. Mary says he knows our lowly estate of being. He knows our name. Amen. And notice this. He, she says he has regarded my humble or low estate. That is the truth of the matter. Here is what makes God great. He regards the lowly. Amen. Praise God. I've heard of students going to huge campuses and, and, and being in college on huge campuses and feeling like they are just a number. They're just one of the many masses, unimportant, just dollars and a, and a possible degree. But I want you to know that in God's spiritual campus, amen, somebody, you're not just a number. He knows your name. He knows the number of hairs on your head. Amen. That's saying something this morning. He, he knows all about you. And I want you to know he cares for you today. Maybe others don't care. Maybe you've been passed over. Maybe you've been passed by. Maybe you've been forgotten. But I want you to know that God knows right where you are. He has not forgotten you. He has regarded our lowly estate. And the Bible says that he came to fallen man. He heard our cry. Amen. From Malachi to when the, 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 the New Testament is written, 400 years of silence, uh, people crying out, is there going to be a Savior? Crying out from their disobedience. Psalm 18, 6 said, in my distress, I cried to the Lord and he heard me. I want you to know that God answered the cries. Hallelujah. He answered the cries of people, the cries that had not yet been made, the cries that were happening at that time. He answered them with the cry of a baby in a cold, dark stable one night in Bethlehem. Hallelujah. Yes, God, he, he answered the cries of all those people, millions of people since then. He answered them in the form of the Christ child. 
in the manger. Amen. I know what the song says. The song says, I love the Lord because he heard my cry. And he pitied every groan. Amen. As long as I live and trouble rise, I will hasten to his throne. Did you know that he did for you what you are incapable of doing for yourself? How would he leave us? He can't leave us. Amen. But he sent his very best for us. Hallelujah. You and I were one of the left outs. You and I were one of the losers on the low down, the lowly, in a low estate. And he has regarded our helpless estate. How do you know this, Pastor? How do you know this? Well, Paul wrote about it in Philippians as maybe he was pondering about it. Philippians, the second chapter, verses 5 through 10, and it says, Having this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, amen, he was in heaven, he was with God, but he did not count equality with God a thing to be held on to, to be grasped. But he emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. Amen. He humbled himself, becoming obedient to the death of the cross. Hallelujah. How do you know Jesus was born to die? Pass me not, O oh gentle Savior. He heard my humble cry. Has he heard your cry? Amen. I remember my mother saying a long time ago when she got saved on that January, first day of January, she said, I thought about it, Christian, all of the people calling on him that night, and he heard me. He heard my cry. How about you? Do you have that testimony that when you cried out to him, he can hear you? He knows right where you are. He has heard your cry. He answered our cries a long time ago in Bethlehem. He has regarded our lowly estate. Amen. And I want you to know that he still hears the cries of his people today. He still hears the cries of those who call out to him. The word of God said that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And then it goes on to say that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. Do you know that after so many days that Mary who had rejoiced with Elizabeth, the Bible says that she accomplished, amen, what was begun in her was accomplished in that manger in Bethlehem. And little Lord Jesus, as the song says, was asleep on the hay. Amen. The king of heaven born in a stable mild, meek and lowly Christ child. See Jesus in the manger. Can you see him? Yes, yes, yes. Can you see him? He had a mind. This baby born with the mind. Amen. The mind of Christ. The mind of God. And that, that mind was to reconcile the world to himself. Look at Mary. Look at him. He has two hands. Two hands there to touch the sick. To touch the weak and the hurting. To heal and to touch the blind and and the demon possessed and the outcast. He has two eyes. She looks at him as she's holding him in the swaddling clothes. And she sees those two eyes look back at her. And she sees that those two eyes will one day see all of our conditions. Two ears to hear our cries. Amen. Two feet to meet us where we are. Amen. Jesus came to where we are. She noticed as he cried out because he was a baby. He was in a human form and he was a baby. He cried out. But that same mouth would petition his father on our behalf. Amen. She noticed that she felt and held him close. She felt a little heart beating. Hallelujah. To break. What was that heart for? It was to break over our sin. My sin and your sin. He, why? Because he's the Savior of the world. But, but she knew that, that as he was laying there in that manger, that those two hands and two feet and two eyes and heart and mind and mouth and, and two ears one day would not stay in that manger but would go up to an old rugged cross. 
And can you see 33 years later? Hallelujah. Let me close this thing out. It, it says that my Bible reads that Jesus was nailed to the cross by his two hands. Amen. Hallelujah. And, and his two feet and his two eyes saw the crowd. Amen. But he just didn't see those around the cross. He, he saw all of us down through eternity that would be in need of a Savior. Hallelujah. He had two ears that heard the crowds mock him, but he heard my cry. Hallelujah. Somebody. He, he had a heart that was broken because his father had turned his back on him, but he had one mouth. Hallelujah. To issue for salvation. He spoke to a thief and the thief got saved. Amen. He spoke to his disciple about his mother, but he also spoke to his father. And do you understand what he said? Because that has to do with you and I. When he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And that is on our behalf. He, he asked his, his father to forgive us on behalf of his sinless, amen, perfect sacrifice on Calvary. On Calvary, he heard my cry, church. On Calvary, he heard your cry, church. On Calvary, he finished it, amen. But Calvary came through Bethlehem. Calvary came up through 30 years plus three. Calvary happened on a Friday, but early on a Sunday morning, he got up with all power in his hand. Power to save. Power to help me live during the pandemic. Power to love. Power to, 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 to tell people about the, the matchless love of Jesus Christ. Power to preach his word. Power to get happy. Power to be joyful. Power to know that God is over the impossible. Power to praise him. And I praise him today in the midst of this congregation that is not here. I even want you to know that the Lord is good and he's good all by himself. He's a great God. He's a mighty God. He's a saving God. He's a loving God. Merry Christmas, church. God bless you. God is great and he's great forevermore. Praise the name of the Lord in this place. Hallelujah. We pray today in this message that you have heard the word of the Lord. We pray today in this message that you understand that God is a great God. And there's no other God like him. Amen. We pray today that as you consider the true meaning of Christmas, that you'll know. That you will know that he favors the unfavorable. Amen. He overrules the impossible. He inhabits the praises and he has regarded, he's thought about our lowly estate. Thank you, Jesus. May God bless you. Let us bow our heads. Lord, we thank you this morning. We thank you for your preached word. We thank you for the truth of this text. Mary magnified you because she knew. She knew that you were God and you had come to reconcile fallen man. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that you speak to someone today that is of low estate. Someone that has fallen and feel like they can't make it, can't get up. They, they don't know which direction to go. But as they have listened to this truth of this message, they will know that Jesus is the only Savior. For you have said that I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father except he comes by me. I pray that they will call out to you before it is everlasting too late and that they will surrender their lives to you. For there is no other help but in Jesus the Christ, the greatest gift of Christmas, the greatest gift ever given. I pray now so more than ever that people will understand the truth that you gave your only begotten son, that whosoever, that's anybody, that should believe in him shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. Lord, I thank you today. And just as you came all those many years ago, you are coming again. And I know one day you will meet us in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. I pray everybody that listens to this recording has that confidence to know that they will be with you one day. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Amen. God bless you all. Have a Merry Christmas uh, to you and your family and to all of your kindred and friends. We pray and we, we just thank you uh, from us here at Pink Creek Baptist Church. God bless you.